really need some uh, intro music, some public domain kind of something, a jingle to uh, play during these splash screens right before we get going. Um, welcome, happy Friday, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's staying safe during the uh, during the pandemic. Remember, take all the necessary precautions, maintain your social distancing, uh, and welcome back to my studio uh, or my study, rather. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in, and uh, of course I would like to thank Mesa Prieta for the opportunity to give these monthly talks. Today we're going to be hitting a little bit of a hard-hitting issue, and so there's going to be a lot of detail uh, involved. I'm going to try to gloss over as much as possible without losing the quality of content. Uh, as with a topic as potentially sensitive as discussing gender, especially non-binary gender, there are a lot of asterisks next to every single point that I make, a lot of caveats to anything that I say. Rather than go down each and every one of these rabbit holes in the middle of the talk, I'm going to try to just move as quickly as I can without losing quality, and if you have questions, need something clarified, uh, or want to disagree, please uh, post those comments in the chat, uh, and I will try to get to them as soon as I can. So, uh, we'll save some time for question and answer at the end. There is a lot of material to cover, and so we've kind of narrowed the scope of this talk. So. I'll be discussing, of course, gender and non-binary gender in Southwest archaeology. I'm going to roll into the Southwest, the Mojave Desert. Typically, this is more considered a part of the Great Basin, both, uh, both culturally as well as hydrologically. <laughs> but, you know, for the, for the sake of this discussion, the Mojave Desert is very much intertwined with the plateaus of the southwest and uh, really butts up against the Sonoran Desert so we'll include them in this talk uh, but for the most part we're keeping this geographically constrained. There are a couple of examples at the end that are sort of outside of those geographic constraints in neighboring regions and that just sort of adds a little bit more uh, context to what we're going to be discussing. Before we dive in, uh, again, I would like to thank you all for tuning in, for your support. If you would like to support what the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project does, uh, first, of course, like, share, subscribe these videos, ring the little notification bell, uh, follow us on social media, uh, especially Facebook and Instagram, visit our website, mesaprietapetroglyphs.org, and if you want to support us, head over to our shop. There are plenty of items in our online store. Of course, proceeds go to benefit the project, uh, as well as there is a donate button. So um, please support, support what we do. Uh, and this will uh, help us provide more content in the future. So well, without further ado, let's, uh, let's dive in. And I think we're actually going to begin with a little bit of story time. Let's get the, uh, the old home ready here. Coyote lived alone in his house, collecting willow to make baskets. He killed green blowflies for buzzing, but the buzzing continued. In the, bu in the buzzing, he began hearing the sound of a song, and so he began to sing and dance. Maybe I am going to be a doctor, said Coyote. Immediately, he heard the laughing of geese. The geese gave Coyote white feathers with which to fly. Either out of fear or sheer spite, the geese, or sometimes it's just one goose, tricked Coyote, sending him tumbling into the rocks below. His head split open, his brain spilled out. Coyote filled his head with white rocks. He tried to follow the geese, but he could not catch up. He came to a body of water. Here he saw, uh, here he saw dead people strewn face down on the shore. One dead body he saw, uh, 
One dead woman he saw had a swollen belly. He cut her open and found a little baby girl. You will be my sister, he told her. You will be my baby. Coyote became a woman to raise the child, fashioning teats of clay and steamed them by the fire. In this way, Coyote invented pottery. Coyote made a willow cradle to carry the child. Uh, whom he called son. As they traveled together, the child grew. In time, Coyote fell in love and so turned back into a man. You will be my wife, he told the matured child. The adopted child reminded Coyote, when you first found me, you said I would be your sister. So Coyote and son traveled to Wolf's house. Wolf being, of course, Coyote's brother. Uh, after a little bit of a uh, dispute over dinner, Coyote's daughter angrily left and did not return. The daughter went to a cave in the mountains where she met a bighorn sheep. The sheep was a human man, and they were married. Coyote continued living the bachelor life with his brother Coyote. So, what does this story have to do with anything? This is, um, go back here. This story is what we call the Series 3 creation myth for the Shoshone and Paiute. The creation myths, or the origin stories, are very gendered. Series 1 is the boys coming of age story. Series 2 is the girls coming of age story. And then we have Series 3. We'll go a little bit into some of the symbolism and details and relevance of this story as the talk progresses. But we have to lay some foundation work first. And so we'll begin with concepts of early man and the use of early man in archaeology of the early and middle 20th century. This culminates in a controversy around a conference and a book called Man the Hunter. That controversy spurred on what came to be known as the feminist critique in anthropology. And so the feminist critique is really when we get our first honest discussions, academic discussions about gender and how it can be reflected in the archaeological record. So we will have to address the early man, the implicit biases of early anthropology, as well as feminism and the feminist critique before we can uh, even begin to address gender more earnestly. From there, we'll then have the foundations to discuss non-conforming gender and non-conforming sexualities in uh, a section that we'll be calling Queering Archaeology. After that, we'll talk a little bit more about how this manifests in the genders of the Southwest as illustrated by case studies, both in the Pueblos and among non-Pueblo societies. We'll expand these case studies just a little bit further before uh, wrapping up in a little bit of a synthesis of these ideas. And as always, I'll be providing my references. You should see the references already listed in the discussion, or rather in the description below. So please check those out. Before getting any deep, more deeply involved, excuse me, we should preface the discussion. First and foremost, gender does not equal sexuality. Gender does not equal physical sex. Gender does not equal sexual orientation. We really see it more of sort of a matrix of performed gender roles, sexual orientations, and uh, physical sex. But again, this is where things get very complicated and uh, rather than trying to describe all of the caveats and nuances here, it's most prudent to just move on. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those at the end. Now, we should consider how the social sciences have addressed studies of gender. And really what we're 
talking about with that within the realm of anthropology is that sociocultural anthropology, or some of you may just know as cultural anthropology, provides most of our foundational information for the study of gender and how it's expressed in societies around the world. Specifically here, I'm talking mostly about non-Western societies. Although, again, another caveat, Western societies influence how we describe non-Western gender expressions. When we're talking about physical sex, then we're getting into the biological and physical anthropology realm. And this really involves uh, studies of the metrics of, of skeletons as well as or you know the metrics of human remains as well as genetic studies open a lot of doors and these allow us to estimate the sex of the individual the physical sex of the individual I say estimate and not determine for a good reason because there are always exceptions to the sorts of patterns that we see and we can only make these estimates based on broader scale patterns over larger collections and there's any number of reasons why these might vary. One of the metrics that can be observed is uh, our occupation markers on the skeleton where muscle attachments have become extra robust where there seems to be extra wear on the skeleton and this gives us a sense of somebody's occupation. So, for example, we might see somebody whose overall physical human remains appear to be uh, appear to be female, and yet the occupation markers might be associated with a male task, or vice versa. We might see the occupation markers of what, from sociocultural studies, we would expect to be a women's task, such as. Uh, if we're working in the Americas, such as grinding seeds, nuts, and corn, but the other markers on the skeleton might show an indication of a uh, physical sex, uh, of a uh, male physical sex. So we might be able to see discrepancies here. There have been a lot of high profile cases where grave goods are assumed to be of a male occupation, but genetic studies and measurements of the physical remains have led people to believe that the uh, the body is most likely that of a woman even if the grave goods are what we would expect for a man. So here's another area where we might see that. Now working with human remains can often be a difficult and sensitive topic and is something that I generally try to avoid. So in those cases where um, we might want to look at things that are not grave goods and not the physical body. So this is where household archaeology comes into play. And so we take detailed studies of internal spaces, domestic spaces, and architecture of both elite and commoner residences to try to estimate or to try to interpret what was going on in those spaces, what kinds of roles those individuals filled. In this way, we can address the gendering of space. However, we're often lacking the ability to address the actual physical sex of the individuals who occupied those spaces. Finally, oral traditions, and this kind of reps back to sociocultural studies. However, oral traditions can also be supplied firsthand by members of a particular cultural tradition. So not always supplied by professional anthropologists uh, we might get the, uh, we might work with individuals who are um, historians for their, for their respective groups and might be willing to provide oral traditions. So that's another line of evidence that we can use to address gender. And I do want to say uh, hi to everyone from Ojo Sarco to Wimbudo to Cleveland. So again, thank you all for uh, for tuning in, and I see Dixon there too. So, uh, all right. So, the topic of gender in archaeology was really seen as hmm, superficial or ancillary, or for that matter, many consider it even irrelevant to the larger social sociocultural processes. This was especially true for 
for archaeologists who were very entrenched in a particular sort of positivist, pseudoscientific, or at least at the time considered fully scientific, uh, uh, who were entrenched in these scientific worldviews of the early and middle 20th century, who believed that cultures moved along regardless of the genders of those inside and the contributions of different gender roles to the overall processes of cultural development and change were not an important topic. So this was exemplified by a 1990, or rather 1966 conference called Man the Hunter, which led to a 1968 publication by the same name. This is largely considered to be the heyday of a paradigm in archaeology that was called cultural ecology. Now, for those of you who have not taken, say, uh, an advanced honors course or graduate student course in archaeological theory, which, like, of course, why would you? Uh, cultural ecology was a structure of theories focused largely on unilineal evolution of cultures as well as environmental determinism. So this means that the same sorts of cultural traits would be expected to occur in the same sorts of environments. Uh, cultural ecology has largely been replaced by behavioral ecology, but this is, again, another rabbit hole we're not going to go down here. The Man the Hunter Conference synthesized ethnographic and some archaeological research on hunter-gatherers from around the world, particularly those living in what we call the ethnographic present, which the ethnographic present is merely when anthropologists came to study these, so starting in the middle to late 19th century and up through the early and middle 20th century. This conference characterized many peoples around the world who engaged in a variety of uh, subsistence tasks as hunters. For example, Paleo-Indians were characterized simply as big game hunters with little attention given to other cultural expressions. This is not to say that Paleo-Indians did not hunt big game, because they certainly did, but the presumption that this was the main driver for subsistence and for cultural expression at large was exactly that. It was an assumption. This and many other assumptions expressed the unintentional biases of this conference. After all, the title was not meant to, uh, was not meant to be sexist. It was meant to be attention-grabbing. However, it does come with the implicit notion that men's activities and only men's activities were the primary drivers for cultural expression and cultural change. It also implied that hunting was the most important activity in foraging societies, particularly nomadic foraging societies. Finally, it also grows out of a system of thought in which subsistence activity was thought of as subsistence activities were thought of as really simply extracting energy in the most efficient way possible. There's a lot of ways to dissect that idea and again too many rabbit holes to really go down every one of those. Another thing about the Man the Hunter conference is that it was also very much the Man the Presenter and Man the Author conference, as there was only one woman who participated, and interestingly, her paper was the only one that addressed people rather than cultural processes devoid of people. There were many critiques of this conference that began almost immediately in uh, 1968, 1969, and continued throughout the 70s. But for more contemporary breakdowns that kind of synthesize more of the literature, I would recommend uh, Rogers' article, uh, Rogers, 2007, and 
see the references in the description, as well as Sterling 2014 does a sterling job of summarizing the controversy without uh, being too biased in uh, picking out the problems. So to return to many of the assumptions and biases that this conference had, uh, many of these have been overturned in uh, subsequent times. And really, a lot of that was because these assumptions were somewhat wishful thinking. They could be summarized in phrases like the basic form of, or the most essential blank, the most essential religion, the most essential, well, religion was seen as kind of, um, it, it, it was seen as epiphenomenal, which means that it wasn't related to the actual cultural processes. But you could say the uh, most essential life ways, the most essential tasks, the basic form of, you know, the basic form of culture, the basic form of family structure, of kinship structure, which was kinship structure, interestingly, was a topic of this conference and really did not address any of the actual individuals involved. You should check out a kinship chart sometime. It's pretty mind-bending, but again, often devoid of people. Also, these kinship structures, if I am to go down just one of these rabbit holes, often presume binary gender, a problem we'll come back to. So the prevailing paradigm for the Man the Hunter uh, conference and for the overall the cultural ecology paradigm was that gender was seen as stable and invariant and thus was a variable that could be ignored as a source of social change. And, and, and that right there is it was thought of as a variable, simply as if it was another factor in a math equation. But because that variable was considered invariant, gender was presumed to be a constant and thus not relevant in the equation. So, of course, the feminist critique would uh, very much disagree with this. So, like I said, early descent to the Man the Hunter conference began almost immediately and continued throughout the uh, 1970s. However, some of the first responses were kind of not fully developed. We could say that they were uh, undercooked. Um, and it really did take some time for uh, more thorough and co cogent arguments to not only be made, but to be accepted by publishers. Again, in the 70s and even throughout the 80s, it was seen as uh, potentially a career-ending move if a professional archaeologist, if a faculty member were to publish a paper with an express overt feminist leaning and to have it flop. So this was seen as risky to even make feminism a topic, um, potentially career ending. Yet many, uh, many bright archeologists, the vast majority of whom were women, took on this challenge. And in the 80s and 90s, we really started to see a shift in which gender had to be overtly addressed. And this is because that, as was pointed out in so many of these papers, is that when gender is not overtly addressed, it becomes implicit. That goes back to the Man the Hunter conference in which the cultural driver was presumed to be men because there was not a gender consciousness. Not because there was an intentional bias, but because there was simply not an effort to actually address gender in a thorough, rigorous, and empirical way. Now, as this, as this feminist critique began to take hold in archaeology, one of the things that sort of emerged into the consciousness of our, of our practice and our discipline is that women's work has been significantly undervalued both as a topic of research such as uh, food preparation and processing in the past as well as gathered foods which were 
again, because gender had been, up until this point, presumed and not investigated, gathering activities of plant materials, seeds, nuts, etc., was simply presumed to be women's work. So this was understudied. Well, also, the practices in academia that were considered to be uh, that were considered to be women's work or feminized even implicitly, especially laboratory research, had been significantly undervalued, was less likely to get published, less likely to get funded, and honestly, I shouldn't say was, because this is still a problem that our discipline is grappling with today. So, oh, I just shrink myself down here. I just kind of want to I want to hang out in this uh, corner of the screen for a minute while we're talking here. Uh, many of these slides are full of bullet points. I didn't have room for a lot of images, and there's not a lot of images that I could sensitively include in this. Um, so sorry, this is a heavily PowerPoint presentation. To get back on the topic here, uh, one of the foundational papers in opening up uh, discussions of feminism and gendered studies in archaeology was by, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation on this name, uh, Domasnes, uh, who said, the great, advantage, the great advantage of gender as an analytic tool is that it operates at all levels of society, structuring, uh, from structuring daily life to cosmologies. And so this is something we're going to come back to. We look for gender, especially in those daily quotidian concerns, the household level, the individual level. But the, the really hard-hitting stuff, and, and I think some of the important stuff that's gonna, going to come out of what I'm about to cover, is how it relates to cosmology and how gendered expression works uh, both to shape cosmology as it is shaped by. In other words, it is discursive. Gender is, as Kelly Hayes Gilpin would say, relational. In other words, prior to the feminist critique, uh, and even early on within that paradigm, gender was seen as structural, as binary, uh, male, female. And what Kelly Hayes Gilpin points out is that this is not always the case, that genders are defined in relationship to each other, and that's a part of what creates this room in between. And how do different cultures negotiate that? We're about to get there. But it is important that uh, we recognize that gender must be investigated and cannot be presumed. Again, because gender is relational, it's not some inherent, invariant, structural binary in which there is a universal role for men and a universal role for women, the way in which things, tasks, objects, animals, places, and of course people are gendered is in, it's in relationship to, to the things around, to the other roles, and to a particular worldview. And this is actually very highly variable across cultures. So what is considered masculine, what is considered feminine, varies even between neighboring cultures that were in protracted contact with each other. And we can skip a little bit of reconstructing gender, uh, gender division of labor, and we could say space too, from material culture and biological markers. This is something we do. You should keep that in the back of your head. How do archaeologists address gender? Well, we reconstruct it from the material evidence as well as the oral traditions and ethnographic work. And the last point I want to make on the slide is as Judith Butler says, gender is performative. It, it is something that is embodied and expressed that it is not something that is uh, solidly assigned, but that is reinforced through expression. And so that brings us to grappling with gender. Because if gender is performative, then that creates room for these spaces in between to be negotiated. And this is something that 
was very difficult early on in European contact, particularly with the Americas, but also with other regions of the world, as uh, it, mercantilism and colonialism spread rapidly in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. Europeans who were previously just absolutely deeply immersed in their own Western Christian ideal of binary gender constructions and very rigid bender, gender roles had difficulty understanding what they were encountering in the world and the individuals that they were encountering. So different European cultures responded differently. The Spanish uh, colonizers, uh, especially missionaries, conquistadors, responded very differently to the individuals they encountered who did not express these very binary male, female, and you know, along with that particular tasks that the Spanish believed were masculine and feminine. Uh, so, yeah, they, um, the Spanish responded very differently from the French, who responded very differently from Anglos. So, overall, the overarching theme is that whether simply the male and female gender roles were constructed differently, such as Pueblo women farming versus farming in Europe was seen as a masculine activity. Uh, Pueblo men weaving, we'll come back to that, that was totally a thing. These were seen as feminine tasks to the colonizers, and so uh, it was seen as feminizing to the men and, and thus as uncivilized add in the fact that you had individuals who did not fit in to, to even these traditional roles, so that there were, even within Pueblo society, uh, people who were anatomically male who engaged in women's tasks. This was used, uh, these examples were used to describe these various peoples around the world as primitive, as uncivilized, and to rationalize colonialism and subjugation. Now, the Spanish were fixated on very uh, strongly Catholic morals, uh, and especially on sin. So they saw these, um, they saw anyone who would not conform to binary gender roles as sinful. Uh, and many were reprimanded by missionaries for exactly that. However, the French mentality was very different. Uh, French tried to understand and reconcile uh, gender nonconforming individuals through archetypes uh, of French fantasies as either degenerate monsters or as divine prodigies. And so uh, French chronicles will use words that often translate to hermaphrodite to describe simply gender non-conforming. In other words, they were not necessarily physically intersexed individuals, but rather were gender non-conforming. However, this was the category that in French colonial culture fit within an existing ideology, and so people were boxed into this. Over time, debate shifted away from particularly the Spanish fixation on sin and whether uh, applying morality to this so the debate shifted from whether uh, gender nonconforming individuals were, uh, were moral or immoral to the debate over what would come to be known as cultural relativism, which is, can you ascribe moral value to cultural differences? Particularly, we're talking about 19th century academics discussing this here, so they're particularly comparing things to a baseline of Western European Christianity. Enter the social sciences in the late 19th century, and then we see this shift away from a discourse of morality towards one of pathology. In other words, there was an attempt to pathologize and medicalize the uh, gender non-conforming individuals and uh, non-binary gender expressions. 
one of these examples was uh, was that in the late 19th century, it was seen as an emasculating disease of enfeeblement. So here we see, again, this uh, many layers of presumptions of what gender and masculinity is in particularly Western Christian colonial value systems as being applied to under individuals. But the pervasive idea was whether it was a question of morality or of pathology, that this always came back down to the idea of labeling non-binary individuals as perverse labeling non-binary or, um, for that matter, queer sexualities as perverse, which, again, is very problematic. So now we can get into some of the theories that kind of have been used as remedies or at least have been attempted to be applied. One, of course, is just taking cultural relativism to the extreme saying, uh, which would be to presume that, no, you can't apply it morality across cultures. However, there are examples in the world where, in fact, there are limits to cultural relativism, right? We tend to, not to compare apples to oranges, but we tend to not endorse genocide on a global scale, right? So extreme cultural relativism has its limits, but when applied to gender, it it does seem that cultural relativism should be uh, overall the uh, overall the view that we take. There are a number of theoretical models that have been applied, including social constructionist theory, queer theory, intersectionality, actor network theory. So, queer theory as a, uh, it's an individual focused set of theories that presume that the individual is the basic unit of agency and of expression. An alternate theory is that of intersectionality, which considers individuals to be convergences of the events that happen in their lives and the cultural processes that lead to them. This is, leads to a lot of uh, analysis of very particularist sort of case studies. An alternative theory to intersectionality is actor network theory, which takes a slightly more structured approach. Um, but actor network theory tends to be more useful for computational models. But all of these sort of orbit around where we see sex gender systems, systems of gender expression and sexuality as matrices, right? That non-binary gender does not necessarily mean a queer sexuality and vice versa, right? Instead, we shouldn't presume that any of the models that we see elsewhere are applicable to the cases that we're studying, and instead we should inquire into gendering, especially as it relates to prestige, labor, craft specialization, and ideology. As Thomas Dowson said, archaeologists have ignored sexuality largely because of the presumption of heterosexuality as the norm. It is self-evident and any discussion is superfluous. However, Dowson's being tongue-in-cheek by this, uh, the second sentence in here, because heterosexuality in fact is not the norm and we see any number of uh, cases around the world, the most famous being from the Marquesas, in which uh, when boys come of age, in order to become a man, they must absorb masculine energy from older adult men by engaging in a, in a sexual act. So our construction of heterosexuality is in fact born out of 19th century academics trying to grapple with three to four centuries worth of uh, chronicles of missionaries and merchants and geographers encountering non-European, non-Western European societies around the world. Now it's time to dive into some case studies. 
So we have the case study of Hastein Kla from Navajo, or who was Navajo. And Kla happened to actually be uh, a close acquaintance of Mary Wheelwright, who would deserve, you know, of course, her own talk on her own. So Kla helps exemplify some of the Navajo ideals and was considered Nadaleehe or Nado, meaning some would say one who has been changed or one who dresses as a woman. Uh, depending on who you ask, you get sort of different answers on these. Let's, uh, uh, maybe if we move, let's, let's move my head. Can, can I move my head? It's not letting me move my head. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So we'll just turn that off. Um, so, uh, Nadale Ehe or Nadal, such as Claw, were considered as honored by the gods and blessed with unusual mental acuity. This was, in fact, the case uh, for other groups, not just the Navajo as well. Interestingly, and I just put this in here because I thought it was fascinating, that um, uh, Navajo who encountered Euro-American women wearing trousers thought that they, too, were Nadaleehe. Um, the patron of Nadal, or Nadaleehe, was the, uh, the two-spirit deity Bego Chidi'i. So, two-spirit, what's that? Well, if we were to rewind a, uh, just a page, um, huh, yeah, actually I seem to have skipped ahead, so um, let's rewind and talk about the term bird atches. This is considered an offensive term these days, and so I don't use it myself particularly, but this is the term that was used in anthropological literature until very recently. It's borrowed from a French word that was borrowed from a Farsi word used by the, the Persians to mean, <clears throat> in quotes, slave boy. Um, so, birdatch is a potentially loaded term, uh, and it's been used to describe any variety of sexual and gender expressions from simply men who do women's work, to women warriors and chiefs, to anatomical males who lived as women, at, including taking husbands. So the individuals who are covered by this overarching term lived very different lifestyles. Again, it was used for many decades and was a part of a question or a, a conundrum that was seen as the vanishing bird hatch. Uh, this is a conundrum that mostly arises from colonialism as Western European Christian sex gender systems were imposed upon people who were colonially occupied that non-conforming gender expressions were seen as taboo, were actively discouraged, sometimes even with the threat of violence, and so it was presumed that bird ashes would have vanished. However, this is not true, and the examples that we'll cover, include, including Claw, uh, have even been so influential and so conspicuous as to have met U.S. presidents. The term birdatch is a part of this pathologizing of gender nonconforming and was also used to cover sexualities, including um, homosexuality. So again, it's not the preferred term anymore. In the 1980s and 1990s, um, gay and lesbian Native Americans held a conference in which the term two-spirit was adopted as the more formal term. So we, we tend to talk uh, about gender nonconforming individuals as well as those with queer sexualities as two spirits when we're talking about indigenous peoples of the Americas. This comes from a paradigm in which just the rule of thumb in the Americas is that gender was, like I said, gender is relational, not structural. So it's not binary, it instead was seen 
uh, gender systems of Native American groups tend to have three or four gender roles to accommodate nonconforming male and female persons. This often includes important religious roles, again, covered in our examples. Uh, however, there's been a question about how well what we see in the ethnographic present has survived colonialism. This is the issue of survivance and of authenticity. We can just cut that short and say there is good evidence for the survivance of this tradition and its authenticity. Moving right along, back to Claw. Claw knew Mary Wheelwright was considered a noddle among the Navajo and worked um, closely with Mary Cabot Real Wheelwright to record more information about Navajo culture than really any of their contemporaries. This led to the establishment of what is now known as the Wheelwright Museum in Santa Fe. Uh, Claude did have a uh, pupil or apprentice uh, who studied under Claw, who was Claw was recognized as uh, knowledgeable in medicinal plants and um, important um, important cultural and medicinal songs, and was thus considered a. There's no way to use a non-problematic term. Claw was a ritual specialist. A uh, the words often uh, the indigenous words often translate to doctor, which has very good implications because it implies the amount of studying that they have done, the amount of knowledge that they have obtained. Uh, Claw was a, a doctor, a medicine, quote unquote, medicine man, a medicine worker. Um, and so Claude did have a, uh, uh, an apprentice, a pupil, a disciple. However, this apprentice passed away before completing the, the course of study under Claude, who was entering old age. And this is a part of Claude's motivation to work so closely with Mary Cabot Wheelwright to preserve so much Navajo knowledge that would have otherwise been lost. This was not universally accepted at the time among the Navajo, but has been, has since generally come to be accepted. So in that role as a traditional doctor, Claude led ceremonies and helped document sand painting as well as make tapis, uh, make textiles with sand painting iconography. We have a, a similar case of Wehua. Uh, we -wa, there's a glottal stop in there, I'm not too good at that as an English speaker, uh, who was Zuni. So uh, Navajo was decidedly not a Pueblo tradition versus Zuni is a decidedly Pueblo tradition, but is also unique among the Pueblos. The traditional Zuni words for uh, individuals who we now know as two spirits were Ihama and hi Ihamana, uh, both meaning man woman. So, in the modern Zuni language, which is still a living language, new words have emerged, including Ihala, uh, Ihalha, which is mostly used to describe individuals who are sexually attracted to members of their same sex which is distinct from the word itzawaki, meaning boy-girl, which has come to be used by some in place of or otherwise interchangeably with ihama. Uh, it depends on who you ask which way the, these words are used, and there seems to have been some uh, shift in the lexicon over recent decades. So, this linguistic evidence shows that the two-spirit tradition was both reproduced and transformed. In other words, a pre-colonial tradition is reproduced because we do have words, but the changes in the words and, and what well, the changes in the lexicon have come to indicate that this two-spirit tradition within Zuni has also been transformed in the modern era. We should, not, we should not discount the influence of outside cultures, but we cannot discount internal processes within Zuni culture as well. 
there is, like in the Navajo example of uh, a deity, Bego Chidi'i, Zuni also have a Kachina, or sometimes we consider Kachinas to be Pueblo deities, uh, uh, Ko Lahamana. So you can see the, the root of Ihamana in Ko Lahamana. So Wa was a Zuni two spirit who, like Kla, was a ritual specialist, uh, was a recognized doctor and a keeper of knowledge. We studied traditional, uh, they studied traditional medicine and ceremonies for 25 years. And this is the case with many two spirits. Wehua never married, but was knowledgeable in medicine ceremonies and place names. Wehua was a renowned craft worker and craft specialist in crafts that within the Pueblos were considered both masculine, such as weaving, and feminine, such as potting. If you remember that story at the beginning, even though that story at the beginning was from the Shoshone and Paiute, that when Coyote became a woman, uh, Coyote in, invented pottery in order to, to make breasts with which to nurse the, uh, the adopted child that Coyote saved through what is very clearly a description of a cesarean section. So in that story, Coyote was a doctor was incredibly knowledgeable in uh, both tradition and in actual medical practice uh, and crossed gender lines so much, at, uh, even so far as to transform uh, uh, transform their own body. And, and I, I should say that in many indigenous cultures of the Americas, clay is seen as flesh and so by applying clay to the chest, that is essentially conceptualized as actually applying skin and flesh. Okay, so we we see the uh, we hear these in oral traditions, these examples, and we see these cases like Kla and Wetwa, who actually embody exactly what we hear from the ideology. Wetwa kicked off commercial production of crafts such as textiles and Zuni, and well Zuni. Mo, uh, Zuni's uh, specialized craft exports now more are into silversmithing, the very model of marketing uh, specialized craft works to a more commercialized public really did get kicked off by Wetwa. Wetwa was, interestingly, a member of the Men's Kachina Society but often in dances played the role of the two-spirit Kachina, Ko'liahmana. What we see in Zuni is actually applicable to many of the Pueblos across New Mexico. However, there was a lot of variation. So we do see dualism and the use of space up here. So we, we do understand that there was, that there were spaces and activities associated with those spaces that were considered to be masculine and feminine. However, we have plenty of examples of individuals who, like Wa, were able to cross in between the masculine and feminine spaces more or less freely. We also see animals were gendered. Raptors were associated with men and waterfowl associated with women. So when we look at iconography, if we see iconography of birds, we might understand that to be gendered. And if we see raptors being combined with waterfowl, we might be able to infer either a unity of the masculine and feminine or a straddling of these categories. So these dichotomies in space and activities were not necessarily structural binaries, but were really more an expression of relational gender that some individuals were able to negotiate in between. The Tewa Pueblos were possibly more permissive than uh, some other Pueblos like Hopi when it comes to marriage arrangements and gender expressions. So Tewa might have had the flexibility that we see in Zuni uh, with Wetwa, but we might not presume that to be the case for Hopi. That said, I want to refer to this example of gender construction on the right hand side. This is uh, an image from, again check the references down below. Jolie 2014, 
who illustrated a loom in, um, who illustrated a Hopi loom. Now this would be a very similar technology to looms used among other Pueblos. And if you'll, if you'll notice, this loom is mounted to a wall and a ceiling because it is meant to be inside of uh, a kiva, which is a men's ritual space. Here we also see a difference between Western and non-Western ideologies about the structuring of space and the gendering of space, as the kiva is seen as an internal and private space. So men were associated with private space and weaving. This, these were considered masculine in Pueblo society, whereas public spaces like plazas and uh, farming fields might have been considered to be more feminine, especially fields used in farming, at least prior to the Spanish coming in and be mucking that all up and being like, no, 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 it, 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 it's men, men who do the farming. Um, so again, we can't presume that when we see weaving an immense space that this is necessarily uh, a matter of non-conforming gender because we have to take into account the uh, cultural traditions and cultural idea cultural spe specific cultural ideologies of gender construction before we can go on to make these more nuanced interpretations. So again, these were somewhat disrupted by uh, uh, colonialism, and so masculinity and femininity took on new connotations after context, and so the timing of the evidence that we see in the archeological record is also important, and that's why the question of transmission versus disruption, of uh, communication and continuity versus the, the vanishing bird hatch and you know, inauthenticity becomes such a problem. But when we see instances of, say, Wetwa or Claw, we can also understand these uh, individuals, too, in expressing non binary gender, to be resisting these colonial paradigms. And in fact, pretty successfully, because both Wetwa and Claw met presidents of the United States. Um, I believe, and I might mix up which one is which, but one met Chester A. Arthur, and Chester A. Arthur, and the other met, I believe, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, next, next, there we go. I'll get my head out of the way again. And so the last case study that I want to get to, we're we're going to get a little over on time, but I do want to uh, address the questions that I'm seeing here. Is uh, the Great Basin shamanism, because the Great Basin was very strongly in contact with the Pueblos, especially the Mojave Desert, part of the Great Basin. And here, too, we have uh, a tradition of two spirits that was ethnographically documented. Now, it depends on the ethnographer, and some researchers, like Julian Stewart, didn't give it much attention, but others, like Isabel Kelly, who, um, one, was a woman working in very much a man's world at the time, but Isabel Kelly did a great job of uh, describing um, in, in Kelly's documents, bird atches, in today's parlance, two spirits who were especially involved in shamanism. So they too were doctors, ritual specialists. And the, the degree that Isabel Kelly documented varied from some men simply engaging in women's work, like seed and nut gathering. If we're to go back to that opening story at the, begin, oh, at the beginning, coyote was, gathering, uh, coyote was gathering willow with which to make baskets. This is in dialogue with the boys coming of age story, which begins, coyote was self-sufficient and made blankets from rabbits. The implication being in the boys coming of age story, Coyote hunts. So there is a gendering, but there's also an age class implicit because Coyote, in the boy's coming of age, goes on to hunt big game. So this is going from boy to man. Hunting rabbits was a task for, uh, for women and children, as well as some men. But to, um, so this was, this was at least masculine, 
to be hunting. However, in the series three story, the one in which Coyote is gathering Willow, this is foreshadowing of Coyote going on to take a woman's role in raising and suckling the child. So, uh, raising and nursing the child, sorry. Um, so, this is an example of two-spirit expression, but uh, some, some two-spirits in, in the Mojave would even live as a woman going so far as to take a husband. So we see, even though that gender does not equal sexuality, we do see some relationship between gender and sexual, uh, gender identity and sexual identity and sexual orientation. Um, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one deterministic relationship, but we do see some of, some of that bleeding over. How much that bleeds over is as much a matter of the, the theoretical tools that Isabel Kelly had to work with when documenting Shoshone and Paiute practices, as well as the ideology structures of the peoples with whom she was working. So, this, this, this sort of dual nature of, uh, of Coyote in the story in which Coyote becomes a doctor, because Coyote doesn't become a doctor in the boys coming of age or the girls coming of age. Coyote becomes a doctor in the third gender role that was included in, in these stories, in the, the coming of age as other than boy or girl, right? That's the one in which Coyote becomes a doctor. And so it is largely believed, though not universally, that this dual nature of two spirits allows them to sort of have a foot in one world and the other, in the world of the living and in the spirit realm at the same time. And so this would make them more adept at, um, at engaging in these religious practices, especially in shamanic traditions. Also, shamanic traditions tend to involve bodily transformation as a religious rite, um, especially as a part of entering into altered states of consciousness, which could be uh, very critical to both uh, leading and disseminating the traditional songs in, in public dances, as well as in more private rituals such as, uh, such as healing in traditional medicine. Um, so these altered states of consciousness would often involve bodily transformation anyhow, and so we might see the shaman engaging in this. In the image you see on the left, this is a petroglyph from the Mojave Desert, and we see a ritual specialist, a shamanic doctor, uh, most likely Shoshone, who is well, marked in some ways, we see head decorations, we see signs of uh, being in an altered state of consciousness, but also coming out from the arm on the side here is a net or a, or a textile, and the body is decorated with the pattern of a rattlesnake, which is a spirit guide for girls because of a sort of gender inversion, which is a whole other thing. Um, and so we see this, um, we see a shaman showing probably some semblance of both male and female gender expression. Uh, beyond that would be speculation. Of course, we have examples from all over the world, so I, I don't want you to think that this, uh, that the Southwest is the only example, but in neighboring regions from California to, uh, the, uh, to the Dakotas, to Nebraska, to Texas, to the Great Plains, and all the way out to Florida, we have plenty examples of two spirits in uh, traditional Native American societies some of these uh, these reports are problematic because they're coming from early uh, colonists who were struggling to make sense of, uh, of this within their own pre-existing worldviews. But also we see, you know, uh, 
we see some conflict, such as the example of uh, Murakota Jim, who was was a, a two-spirit, but was forced by members of the Bureau of Indian Affairs to dress as a man. Um, and Maricota Jim, like so many of these other examples, was also a, a, a trained doctor. So, yeah. So I'll just sort of wrap this up, and I, I, I will get to your questions here. Um, what does this have to do with petroglyphs? Well, if we see that the, the doctors, the ritual specialists, uh, have two spirits, I mean, like if some of them are two spirits, and we have, we have good evidence that, well, uh, David Whitley argues that the, the doctors, the ritual specialists, the people who made the petroglyphs were men. And there, there, there was an argument to be made for this. And this is not to say that the majority were not men. Uh, but that two spirits might be most likely are represented as a greater percentage of the trained doctors than as a part of the populace as a whole. This comes from these cultural notions of two spirits being uh, uh, especially intellectually endowed because they have to take on the understandings of both men and women. And so by negotiating the both of these roles, they have double the knowledge of your average person within a particular society. Um, and so they, are, they, they naturally fall into these roles of knowledge keepers who are the ritual specialists and thus the, uh, the, the shamanic uh, practitioners. They are the doctors. They are the doctors in the sense that they have the highest amount of institutional knowledge. And so they are, they are most likely to be in this role that is almost, well, I wouldn't say universally, but is certainly ubiquitously associated with the production of rock art in the Americas, um, particularly west of the Rockies. So, Kelly Hayes Gilpin, though, says that um, we also need to provide an insider perspective on um, who is making the petroglyphs and what their roles and their worldviews are. So when we take into account this, this eth ethnographic evidence, the, the evidence from oral traditions of two spirits, it gives us a better understanding of who's making these petroglyphs and helps provide additional insights into their worldviews and perspectives. So, Wewa and Claw are are just two of many examples of two spirits. They happen to be um, some of the, uh, the best known, the best traveled, and the best documented. But they exemplify how two spirits in general were keepers of knowledge and of songs, and thus, again, the doctors. This helps contextualize our study of gender and archaeology more broadly because it adds a bit of nuance to how gender is both embodied and performed. In that the, we should also consider that the genders expressed in iconography, such as in petroglyphs and pictographs, uh, might not be the artists themselves. It could be inverted, where, say, uh, take the example of a girl's spirit helper might be a snake. Right, so if we see a depiction of a snake, which would be considered a gendered male animal typically, go figure, that this still might be done by a gendered female artist. Uh, but that when we, see, um, when we see the convergence of certain images, such as the image of a ritual specialist combined with snake imagery, which is this diamond chain, down the middle of the body, patterning the torso. That is an image typically produced by women um, making rock art. Then we start to see evidence for the possibility of a non-binary gender expression. Something that we can't look, uh, look for without the context here. And finally, that gender has a reflexive and discursive relationship with ideology and iconography. If we're to refer back to both Claw and Wetwa, 
they have uh, there are archety archetypes that already exist within their cultural traditions of two spirit deities and and yet by embodying these two spirit deities in public performances, public dances, and retelling of the sacred stories, they help to, <clears throat> forgive the pun, flesh out the details of the, the lives, the stories, and the characters of these deities. And in that, the, the deities are shaped by the, the people who express them while still embodying this overall I ideology that is greater than any of the individual uh, performers who might embody them. So, references. Uh, I've got two slides of these. Take your screen cap or whatever. Um, copy them from the description below. Um, this is really just scratching the surface. Two pages of references and it's really just scratching the surface of what's available out there. So, um, yeah, let's get that, get that webcam back here. Alright, and yeah, that's, uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, my streaming software just absolutely crashed. Um, uh, we're back online. I, I was just trying to make my, the, the box with my webcam in it big again and just psh, everything crash. Okay, so quickly, uh, I see a couple of a uh, couple of questions in the chat. I'll just go in order here. D. Garcia says, uh, great series. My question is, do current uses of DNA data essentialize cisgender or binary understandings of the past? Short answer is yes, long answer is sometimes no, but but generally, yeah, um, DNA studies can, I've, I've run into several DNA studies that have been problematic in the way that they, they uncritically apply gender assumptions, particularly of uh, presuming cisgender individuals, when in fact, if we contextualize the DNA study with occupation markers on the skeleton, you know, wear and tear and where the muscles have developed. Uh, if we contextualize that with grave goods, if we happen to have a domestic space associated with this individual, the materials within that domestic space, we do see that the picture gets more complicated. And often the, the, the picture is more complicated than many might expect. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that DNA studies can be used responsibly to illuminate more cases of uh, gender nonconformity. But yes, so many studies are, are done uncritically. So this is just an example of how we need creator crosstalk between, uh, between archeologists, um, biological anthropologists, sociocultural anthropologists, as well as actual uh, uh, actual members of, um, you know, whatever society we're studying, descendant communities, essentially. We need that input um, to be able to do responsible DNA analysis. Paula Lazar uh, asks, any evidence of native people who are biologically female taking on the male gender role? Yes, lots of them. Um, so while I did uh, tend to focus on uh, just my, my couple of uh, examples here were males taking on um, either female gender roles or gender roles that were somewhere in between the two. Um, yeah, there are tons of examples of um, Native American uh, females taking on male gender roles. And um, whether or not that involved dress, sometimes that was dressing it as males, sometimes they continued to dress as women, but fulfilled male roles in, say, uh, hunting parties, in um, some women were known to be, uh, were known to be doctors and to lead songs. Um, uh, so then they too became uh, knowledge keepers. So this could be see, seen, um, depending on the culture that you're working with, as, um, a, a, as a potential two-spirit expression. Um, there are even examples, especially on the plains, of 
women becoming hunting chiefs, war chiefs, and taking wives. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, Kathy Dickey, are there examples from your own area of petroglyphs? Yes, maybe, probably. Um, I would say that, that petroglyph that I was showing from the Mojave Desert is a... Um, that there's actually a couple of examples at that site that, that could be. Um, we see the snake is used both as a... The rattlesnake, uh, Togoav, uh, is seen as a girl's spirit helper, especially during coming-of-age rites, uh, but is also seen as a portal to the underworld. So when we're seeing this mixture of uh, uh, imagery, of clear imagery of ritual practitioners, when you see the patterns on the body, those are uh, a, a ritual specialist. Um, and with the, 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 the diamond chain, uh, that could mean that their spirit guide is... Uh, is the snake, in which case this could be either a girl who is a ritual specialist or, uh, or, or, or a boy who has taken on the, the girl's spirit helper, but it could also just be a reference to crossing into the spirit realm. So there are some ambiguities there, uh, but I would argue that one that I showed uh, is certainly plausible. Um, here at Mesa Prieta, uh, we do have gender ambiguous images. One of the things that's been noted about um, uh, uh, about shamanistic images in petroglyphs worldwide is that while we do see gendered characters, we do see, say, well-endowed males, exa uh, you know, exaggerated female, mo female bodies, even copulation scenes, we also see um, a lot of the images that seem to be depictions of the ritual specialist, especially in periods of transformation, as being gender neuter or gender ambiguous, um, which we have some, we have some on the Mesa. Uh, and I do also want to point out that, like, um, we, we have, we, we have copulation scenes that might depict same-sex uh, interactions or human animal interactions so um, that could be a reference to, to the bodily transformation of the ritual specialist um, and uh, and you know the same sex scenes could actually be same sex encounters so um, yeah we definitely see examples of, um, of two spirits in in the uh, the petroglyphs that's all the questions that I see right now. Um, I'll just check over in the other chat if we've got any others. I don't see any others coming in. We're like 20 minutes over the time here, but uh, I did want to take the time to get to your questions, especially since I didn't do that. Uh, I didn't do that la last month, so I wanted to get to that. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, Thank you again for you know all your support. Again, like, share, subscribe, ring the notification bell, follow us on social media, uh, visit our website, visit our shop, get some swag, yeah, yeah, get some swag. So, peace.